seven. Uh, we know it's a little inconvenient for you in terms of time. But kindly bear with us. So, Maharaj, you know, since it's a working day, some devotees will join five ten minutes later. Please uh, uh, allow them to do that. Okay, so we can start the class, Maharaj. Okay. okay. Om Magyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurum Militanye Nath Hasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschachade Satarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare so welcome everyone to our Bhakti Vaibhav. We're studying Canto 6, chapter number 7, beginning of a new unit. And this chapter is entitled uh, Indra Offends Brihaspati. Let me share the screen. Yeah. Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. So, yes. Uh, Indra offends his spiritual master, Brihaspati. Okay. So, I'll just begin. Although some people will be joining us, they can pick up. Uh, so, connection with the previous chapter, the previous unit. Not hard to understand. We see the question put here by... Maharaj Parikshit, that he'd heard in the previous chapter, he'd heard about Twasta and how Twasta was married to Rochana and they had two children, one of whom was Vishwarup. And Vishwarup, it was mentioned how Vishwarup became the the guru for the demigods, although he was born from the demon side, at least the mother from the demon side. She is the daughter of the Daichas. Rochana was the daughter of the Daichas, and her son, or one of her sons at any way, was Vishwarup. And so it's mentioned like that, and how Vishwarup became the guru for the demigods and so Maharaj Parikshit was puzzled that, well, what about Brihaspati? Why is Brihaspati not, he's supposed to be, he's the guru of the demigods, what happened to him? So Maharaj Parikshit inquires like that, this is, and this leads us into the account of the appearance of Vritasura. 
Vrita Sura is actually, uh, some devotees say, that Vrita Sura is the hero of the Bhagavatam. Hmm. <laughs> Difficult. It's a surprise to hear that. I was surprised to hear that anyway. But on account of what he went through and the difficulties in the demon body, he's actually considered a great hero. So we'll hear more about the appearance of Vrita Sura. But for now, we're hearing about Indra and how he offends his guru, Brihaspati, and it leads to them taking shelter of Vishwarup. This is with the instructions coming from Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma, he was approached by the demigods in their anxiety that we can't find our guru. Oh, of course what happened was after after Indra offended Brihaspati, then Brihaspati made himself invisible by his mystic power. He had that power, he could make himself invisible. So although the demigods were looking everywhere for him, they couldn't find him. So the, the Daichas took advantage of this and under the leadership, under the guidance of their guru, Sukracharya, the Daichas come and attack and conquer the demigods. And the demigods are in great trouble because usually they can defeat the demons, but this time they were defeated. So then they went to Brahma and they got guidance from Brahma. And Brahma told them the cause that because you've offended your guru, so nothing suspicious. So you've been defeated by these daityas. Now you have to get a guru. So Brahma suggests to them that Vishwarup will be a good guru. So we'll go through the chapter bit by bit. I'm just giving a little overview of the chapter. Uh, we will hear at the end of the chapter, the final section, how Vishwarup becomes a guru of the demigods and from Vishwarup he gives them, he gives the demigods the Narayana Kavacha Mantra and with the help of the Narayana Kavacha Mantra they're able to take back all their opulence which the demigod, which the demons had taken from the demigods. So the demigods got back all their opulence with the help of the Narayana Kavacha Mantra. All right, so we'll go into the first section here and see what's going on. We'll look a bit more closely at it. We hear Maharaj Parikshit's question to Sukadeva Goswami. Oh great sage, why did the spiritual master of the demigods, Brihaspati, reject the demigods who were his own disciples? What offense did the demigods commit against their spiritual master? Please describe this. Please describe to me this incident. Hmm? So this is the subject matter, the beginning of this chapter, describing uh, how the demigods offended their guru. And without the blessings of their guru, they were vulnerable. So Sukadeva Goswami begins his account of what happened once upon a time, the king of heaven, Indra. And we hear about Lord Indra, how he's sitting on his throne and he has his wife, Sachi, with him. They're sharing the throne and they're surrounded by all these demigods who are all glorifying them and worshipping Indra. So, all of them were offering their respect and giving service to Indra. And at that time, while Indra was sitting there with his wife, you know, that must have some effect also. You sit there, you know, Indra has a beautiful wife and 
is surrounded by so many people, the Gandharvas are singing and are dancing for the pleasure of Indra, and everything is very nice, very heavenly. It's mentioned even birds and snakes are there, and they're all worshipping Indra. And so, at that time, Brihaspati appeared in the midst, and although Indra was observing Brihaspati coming in, he didn't do anything to honour him. He didn't respect him at all. And it, it's mentioned twice, actually. Sukadeva Goswami mentions it twice here in this section that he didn't do anything. He didn't get up. He didn't show any respect to his spiritual master. So, we should understand that even if you are Indra or Lord Brahma even, who is greater than Indra, even if you are Lord Brahma, you have to offer respects to the spiritual master. But Indra was so intoxicated, you know, the whole situation was so overwhelming for him. Hmm. He has his wife with him and all the demigods are praising him and he's thinking, I'm the king of heaven. And in walks his guru and what he should have done, he should, well, he should have done something, he should have got up, he should have honoured him. Of course, we're hearing this incident, we're reminded of another incident which took place, which is described for us in Srimad Bhagavatam. Maybe we can ask the assembled devotees, you can raise your hand if you can think of a similar incident where the disciple did not offer proper respect to his guru or to some superior person who came into their midst. Yes. See that uh, in the fourth canto, Daksha was offended when uh, Lord Shiva did not uh, respect him, being his son in law. That was one incident where we could see about how Daksha felt. On the contrary, it was actually Lord Shiva who was so glorious beyond these considerations. So we could learn a lesson from that. Yes, thank you. Very interesting example. At the Daksha Yagya. Daksha was offended that Lord Shiva didn't offer him respects. Of course, customary, usually the son-in-law coming before the father-in-law should offer some respect. But because Lord Shiva is a Vaishnava, not just any Vaishnava, but the Param Vaishnava, and because Lord Shiva is always meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord, he doesn't need to offer respects to Daksha. Daksha, of course, is not a... He's a Prajapati. He's a Prajapati, though he's a great soul, but he's not as great as Lord Shiva. <laughs> but Daksha was intoxicated, thinking he's married my daughter, he should respect me. Okay, that's one example. Another example? Yes? Roma Harshuna offended Lord Balaram. Yes. Yes, I think that's the one that immediately comes to mind. The Lord Balaram is on, pari on going to visit holy places and he came to Naimisharanya and he came into the midst of the great sages and everyone offered respect. It said everyone offered some kind of respect, some bowed down, some stood up and offered, some folded their arms, pranams. Everyone except Romaharshan. And Romaharshan is on the seat, he's on the Vyasasan. So Lord Balaram considered that this person is not really fit, he's not really qualified. 
So Lord Balaram decided that in line with his mission to remove the miscreants, he uh, took a blade of kusha grass and pierced the heart of Ramaharsha. Right. So, of course, he, he considered also that this Ramaharshan is not actually the, the pure Brahmana, he's mixed, mixed caste, right? Father was not Brahman, but mother was from the Brahman, something like this. So Lord Balaram considered, I can kill him. <laughs> and even the sages were a, a little upset that we'd given him a benediction of a long life. But Lord Balaram said, well, I can bring him back to life if you like. But they said, no, no, you are the Supreme Lord. The sages of Naimasharanya at least recognize Lord Balaram. And they said, but what about the benediction we give him? So then it was agreed they would give that benediction of the long life to Sutta Goswami. So Sutta Goswami took over speaking. All right, so it's another example. Is there any other example you can think? Oh, yes. Nalakuvera and Manigriva were very disrespectful. They were intoxicated and naked in a holy place. And the pres and Lord N and Narada Muni had come there, so Narada Muni thought that we have to do something about this. These two sons of demigods and they're behaving like this; it's not appropriate. And so they were given special mercy of Narada Muni to become trees. Narada Muni gave special mercy to them that the Lord would personally come there and they would witness Lord Damodar and he would deliver them from their tree bodies. So, yeah, they didn't respect Narada Muni. Yeah, any other example anyone can like to offer? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, actually, even in Bali Maharaj episode also, he didn't... Uh, Follow his Guru's instruction. Right, yes, right. Bali Maharaj, Suk, um, Sukracharya was there telling him, don't give charity. <laughs> but Lord Vamana Dev could, said, Lord, uh, Lord uh, Bali Maharaj rather saw some contradiction in the, in the, in the teachings of Sukracharya that. Previously you told me, give charity to brahmanas. And now this brahmana boy is coming and he's asking charity, I should give him. Even if he is the Supreme Lord. If he is the Supreme Lord, he can take it anyway. So why should I, better I give him. And so in this way, uh, Lord Bali Maharaj rather disobeyed the order of his spiritual master. And of course, the spiritual master was not pleased and put some, <laughs> put some curse on him, but these curses were actually a blessing. Okay, so these are, we see different examples. Also in Chaitanya Leela, can you think of an example? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Chaitanya Chaitanya also, no? uh, uh, Krishna Das Kavira's brother, and their Ram... Mini Ketana. Mini Ram Das. Yes. Yeah. Krishna Das Kaviraj's brother insulted Mini Ketana Ram Das. Mini Ketana Ram Das was quite a, a character and played the flute and would hit people sometimes with his flute. But the brother of Krishna Das Kaviraj had respect for Lord Nichan, had respect for Lord Chaitanya, but not much respect for Lord Nityananda. And Miniketana Ramdas was a follower of Lord Nityananda. So he didn't respect Miniketana Ramdas. 
And Minikitana Ramdas observed that and said, here is the second Ramaharsha. <laughs> so here's the second Ramaharsha. Because he was disrespectful to the spiritual authorities, to the brahmanas, to the spiritual teachers. And so that night, of course, Krishna Das Kaviraj had a dream and Lord Nityananda appeared to him. And Lord Nityananda told Krishna Das, leave home, go, oh, just go, get out of here. And go to Vrindavan, there you will find everything. So Krishna Das Kaviraj, he woke up, he didn't wait for the morning. In the middle of the night, he immediately left home and went to Vrindavan. And he got the shelter of Rupa and Raghunath and Vrindavan. And there he wrote Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, yes. Yeah. Sri Ram, uh, uh, Ramchandra Puri and Sri Ishwar Puri also, Guru Maharaj? Right, Prabhu, yes. Ramachandra Puri was criticizing. He was trying. What did he do? He was. Yeah, he was instructing his spiritual master to focus on the impersonal Brahman. Right, and, yes, uh, right. Ishwara Puri was. Uh, Madhavendra Puri, rather. Madhavendra Puri was leaving the body. And Ishwara Puri was serving him, and uh, Ramachandra Puri came there, and Ramachandra Puri was the disciple of Madhavendra Puri, but somehow he had a leaning towards impersonalism. Now Madhavendra Puri was in the mood of separation from Lord Krishna, feeling separation and he was reciting that famous verse which only Sri Mati Radharani and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Madhavendra Puri can understand. Ae dina dayadra natahe matura nata, like that, that verse, uh, which describes the, the feelings of Sri Mati Radharani in separation from Lord Krishna. And in this way, Madhavendra Puri was lamenting in separation. He was feeling this separation. But this foolish Ramachandra Puri, he could not understand the mood of his spiritual master. And he told him, Oh, Guru Maharaj, don't lament. He said, don't lament. He said, then you should come to the level of Brahman and there you will be joyful. Come to the Brahman. <laughs> And so his spirit, Madhavendra Puri said, get out of here, you foolish person. If I have to see your face at the time of death, I will never achieve my desired destination. So it's very important when you're leaving the body, you don't want to be with impersonalists, you don't want to be with non-devotees, you want to be with devotees who can remind you of Krishna. So Madhavendra Puri... Uh, told Ramachandra Puri, get out of here. And what was the result of his offence against his spiritual master? Uh, he got uh, accustomed to fault-finding Guru Maharaj and mm -hmm. he even found fault with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Right, yes. <laughs> he was finding fault, became a fault-finder. That's a, a big an anartha. If you study the different anarthas which are in the heart, Fault-finding is one of the anarthas. Mm. So he got, that was his result. Okay, we'll go ahead here. We've spoken about the deviations from the, the result of offending the spiritual master. So Brihaspati could understand what was happening. Brihaspati was a... a very advanced, elevated soul, and realized the Brahman, and he could understand the future, and he knew what was happening. And so he, he just left, and first he went home, and he left Indra, and then Indra began to understand. It says here, he could immediately understand his mistake. Uh, so he became repentant that he had disrespected his spiritual master. And in the presence of others, he begins to condemn himself. And he's thinking, what a, what a terrible deed I have done. 
because of my lack of intelligence and because of my pride in my material opulences. So this is the effect of material opulences that one can easily be bewildered, right? There's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita where Lord Krishna warns, right? For the, in the minds of those who are attached, who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification, the resolute determination for devotional service does not take place. So, you have, to, you have to be very careful of having too much opulence, even a little opulence. <laughs> There's a saying in, in English, even the pauper is proud of their penny. And so we have even, we, we may not have much opulence at all, but we could be proud of it and that can bewilder us. And Indra also feels like that. He, he, Indra also feels that, you know, my little opulence, and I've, been, I've, I've caused me to insult my spiritual master. So, he, he said, I fail to show respect to my spiritual master when he entered, and thus I have insulted him. Mm. And, and Indra is really repentant, genuinely repentant, and he's looking at himself very critically. Mm. He said, I was proud. I was in the, although I'm supposed to be in the mode of goodness as a demigod, I was proud of a little opulence and polluted by false ego. Who in this world would accept such riches at the risk of falling down? Alas, I condemn my wealth and opulence. You see, even Indra, the king of heaven, he condemns his wealth and opulence. So, people sometimes, people are often anxious for wealth and opulence. But you can see it's better sometimes not to have it. It's, it's very, dang very dangerous to have a lot of wealth and opulence. So Prabhupada quotes Lord Chaitanya's prayer, how he doesn't want anything. He doesn't want any wealth, he doesn't want followers or people praising him. He just simply wants devotional service. And it's a very nice purport here by Prabhupada. And Prabhupada speaks about how, and he talks about the American dream, you know, the result is that, he says here, the result is that America are now regretting the wholesale criminality of American society and are wondering how America has become so lawless and unmanageable. I think maybe at this time Prabhupada was... Uh, you know, he was traveling one time, it's described, he was in the USA traveling to different centers and he was on a flight and somehow he, he saw the cover of a Time magazine and the cover of the magazine said, crime, what, why and what to do. And Prabhupada was talking that we could give them guidance, we could tell them the solution to the problem. And then actually when they got to, I think it was Detroit, they brought the the head of the police department to meet Prabhupada. And the man was very nice and Prabhupada had a nice conversation with him. And Prabhupada explained how he would have a program to help the American people to stay away from criminality. And he said we would have everyday kirtan and we could have prasadam distribution. And in this way people will all be happy and they'll be joyful. And, They'll forget about all their material problems and anxieties and they won't think about crime. So, Prabhupada was saying, we just want you, uh, the government, the state to support us. If you people will support us then we can do it. We can organize nice programs of kirtan and prasadam distribution and, and this way it will help to change the face of American society. Because it's actually a fact, you know, the nature of the world today, there's so many crimes and 
the prisons are full and the governments, they have to spend so much money on crime. They have to have so many people to run the, the prisons and they have to have so many policemen also. And then the legal system becomes also screwed up with all the crimes taking place. So, if they really wanted to solve the problem, Krishna consciousness is the solution. So Prabhupada talks about the, the, the nature of this material world. And he talks about also, <laughs> he says, the men produced in such a society are less, less than fourth class, right? <laughs> They are, they are the unwanted population known as Varna Sankara. <laughs> this Prabhupada has really put the, hit the nail on the head. He knows exactly where people are at. They have no education, no enlightenment. They don't know the goal of life. And that's why, there's, well, that's why they have so many crimes and so many problems in the world. But then Prabhupada continues, he said, it's a blessing for America. Fortunately, however, Hare Krishna movement has come to America and many fortunate young men are giving serious attention to this movement, which is creating ideal men of first-class character, right? This is, this is actually what should happen when people, young men, come to Krishna consciousness Right? They take up, they, they change, their character totally changes. Prabhupada explained in one letter, in one lecture, he was lecturing on the 16th chapter, Divine and Demoniac Nature, where there's a verse, Pravritim cha nivritim cha janana vidura tsuraha, and the demonic mentality is being described. The demons, they don't know what is pavriti and what is nivriti. They don't know what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So Prabhupada was giving class on this sloka and he said, the Krishna consciousness movement is to change the pavriti of the, the people because people are misguided. They don't know what to do. They eat all the wrong things. They drink all the wrong things. They're, all their behavior is wrong. He said, we want to, we have to change that pavriti and we, we train them in spiritual life and we give them the principles of uh, peace, of cleanliness, mercy, austerity and truthfulness, right? Satyam socham dayatapa, the four pillars of religion. So Prabhupada said, we have to, we, we want to change the pavriti and teach people what they should eat, what they shouldn't do, they should, they, they have to learn, we have to educate people. The, but just having them arrested and put in prison, they don't learn anything. They go to prison and they, be, they become worse, they don't improve. It's like, you know, if you, if you beat people, if you, you know, people may do something wrong, you beat them, doesn't mean they're going to change. This is, this is a wrong way to deal with people. We have to educate people. We have to train them properly. What is the proper behavior? So the example is here. Lord Indra, he had made this mistake. Right? Prabhupada says here, at the end of the purport, long, long ago, Lord Indra regretted his disrespect to his spiritual master, Brihaspati. Similarly, it is advised that the American people regret their mistaken advancement in civilization. <laughs> mistaken advancement in civilization. Okay? That, this is what Prabhupada calls mistaken advancement. They, they think it's advancement, but just degradation, advancement to hell, not advancement to anything good, just become worse. So they should take advice 
they should take advice from the spiritual master, the representative of Krishna. If they do so, they will be happy and there will be an ideal nation to lead the world. So, <laughs> very powerful purport. Okay, going ahead. Uh, so, uh, who's Indra, Indra speaking, right? Yeah, Indra speaking here. So Indra is saying that even you're situated on the throne as a king, the king should not stand up to show respect to another king or a brahmana. It is to be understood he does not, if, if, he, if, if a person thinks that the king does not have to stand up to show respect to another king or brahmana, this is mistake. It means he doesn't know the superior religious principles. Even if you're king, you have to show respect to the brahmanas and to other kings. And then the purport, Prabhupada gives examples, just like Lord Krishna met Narada Muni, and Lord Krishna receives him, and Lord Krishna stands up, even Sudama Brahman, Sudama Brahman, the poorest Brahman, he came to Dwarka, look how Lord Krishna received him, how he honoured him. So Lord Krishna was always very careful to show the right respect and give proper respect especially to the brahmanas and other kings also meet people <laughs> Prabhupada writes here in the purport uh, about, more about the, his, his vision of the American society as it was when he was there he says a society concerned only with manufacturing new cars and new skyscrapers every year, and then breaking them to pieces and making new ones, may be technolog technologically advanced, but it is not a human civilization. <laughs> uh, everything which we, 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 we value, which we th you know people think are so wonderful, skyscraper buildings and motor cars. They think this is advancement. Advancement to what? <laughs> That's the point. Prabhupada said, this is not human civilization. And then Prabhupada goes on to describe what is human civilization. You have to recognize different classes of people. You see, you can see the problem here. Can you recognize, what do you think that is the problem? which is there in the American society? Anybody could like to say? Very clear from Prabhupada's purport. The whole community is driven by the Shudra mentality and there's no guidance that they seek either from any intellectual class, especially on the spiritual matters for one's uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think, the way I see it, I think people, they give more importance to things like buildings and motor cars than they give to people. They don't take care of the person, the people, the character of the people. They're not thinking about the character of the people. They're only thinking, nice car, big building, nice apartment. They're not thinking the character. So the purpose of the Krishna Consciousness Movement is to, to create people of character, of moral principles, of proper behavior, civilized behavior. So this is not appreciated in the West, in countries today. They only think about motor cars, skyscraper buildings. They think this is advancement. They don't care about the character, what is the character, what is the actual standard of behavior. So, sometimes we do get people coming forward, you know, some leaders or more awakened, they're, they're awakened to this and they're pointing out, it's the people which is important. 
And people, when we talk about people, we're concerned about people's behavior and character. This is important. It sets the standards for the world. Going ahead, 14, leaders, <laughs> right? The leaders, the, they have fallen into ignorance and mislead people by directing them to the path of destruction, are in fact boarding a stone boat, and so too are those who blindly follow them. And so th this example is given here, this, this, this stone boat. <laughs> what is it? The as asma plava. Plava. Asma plava. Boats made of stone. So, if the leaders fall into this condition, then what is the hope for the others? The, if, the, if the leaders are all misdirected, then how can we expect any good society? And this is what happens. The stone boat is completely useless. And Prabhupada picks up again, because at this time when he was translating this particular section of Srimad Bhagavatam, he was traveling in America. So he said, unfortunately, although the American people are extremely eager to get out of materialistic chaos, they are sometimes found to patronize the makers of stone boats. That will not help them. And at the end of the purpose, if society is guided by political diplomacy with one nation maneuvering against another, it will certainly sink like a stone boat. So this is the world today. It's all political diplomacy and different maneuvers, different relationships against one nation, against another nation. The one ideology of one nation against the ideology of another nation. Nobody's thinking about the people. They don't think about actually the people, the real character of the people. It's all this diplomacy and politics. We're the best, we're the greatest, you know. <laughs> My goodness. What is the great? They, they have no idea what it means to be great. So this is a lesson from this section here in Srimad Bhagavatam, that we don't want to be blinded by material opulence. And certainly King Indra regrets it. And here in text 15 we hear Indra speaking, how much he regrets, but it's too late. He already offended this, his guru. The guru's gone. He doesn't want to have any more of it. But Indra's appreciating the guru. Now he's changed. He said, guru, he's in the mode of goodness. He's fully aware of all knowledge. He's the best of the brahmanas. Now I shall touch his feet and offer my obeisances, try to satisfy him. Of course, very important to satisfy the Guru, get the mercy of the spiritual master. And we sing every morning, Prabhupada quotes here in the purport, then how we have to get the mercy of the spiritual master. And without the mercy of the spiritual master, just havoc on the path of self-realization. So can you think of some devotees who took advantage, got the mercy of the spiritual master? Do we have some examples? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Dhruva Maharaj took the uh, Narada, Narada Muni's instructions and he he could have Darshan of Lord Narayana. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful example, yeah. 
Narada Muni instructed Dhruva how to do his sadhana, what to do, right? Of course, first of all, he tested him, he told him, he said, no, you're a young boy, you should go back, go home. But Dhruva was very determined. And so Narada Muni saw his determination, so he gave him instruction. And the result was, in six months, Dhruva Maharaj was able to see God. Not immediately, it took six months. <laughs> six months of very intense practice and sadhana. But he got the mercy. Yes, thank you. Very good example. Anyone else? All right. Rukari and uh, Naradmani again. Drupadi? Murugari. Oh, Murugari. Murugari the hunter. Right. Okay. Yes. Very good also, yes, nice example, Muragari, Narada Muni came to the forest and he saw the animals all caught in traps and he thought, Who had, who's the terrible person who's done this? And then he saw the hunter and so Narada Muni told the hunter that, you know, you're giving so much pain to these animals in the future, you will get pain. They will come back in the next life. They're going to give you pain. And Magrari said, well, what can I do? My father taught me this business. This is our family trade. But Narada Muni convinced Magrari that you have to give this up. Don't worry, you give this up and everything will be taken care of. So Magrari followed the instructions of Narada Muni and he went and he sat there and chanted the holy name beside Tulsi and after that he would, didn't even want to step on little insects. He became totally transformed by the grace of his spiritual master's teachings. Okay, very good, thank you. Some, some more examples? One time uh, the demons, uh, uh, like uh, the leadership of Bali, they were, uh, because of the Shukracharya's blessings, they were able to conquer all the demigods. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're going to hear in this chapter actually, how, how it's described here in this chapter, how the, the demons, uh, they were, they were, not disrespectful to their guru. They took advantage of Sukracharya and they properly respected him. And with the help of Sukracharya, they were able to conquer the, de the demigods. And even Lord Brahma was saying they could take even my posts, they're so powerful. So very good, very good example, yes. So we see quite a few examples. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Even we see the Prabhupada, he followed the instruction of his spiritual master. Which one? Which instruction? Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. Do you know? the instructions of his spiritual master and he became so glorious. Can you tell us what, what which instruction? To propagate the Krishna consciousness. Yes. Prabhupada got this instruction from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, you go and preach. And he just stick on that structure that I want to go and preach. And then he could do it by the mercy of his Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Who else? What, what particular instructions did his Guru Maharaj give him? Go and preach to the English-speaking people. Write the book. Yes. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Also, uh, Bhaktisar Saraswati Thakur... Uh, Prabhupada's uh, Guru Maharaj instructed him uh, to translate the scriptures because he had good command over English. Uh -huh. uh, he said, if you ever get money, print books. Right, that, that's, a, that's a key one, right? That's the one we hear. If you ever get money, use it to print books, he told him. So Prabhupada pretty much followed that. You know, he, he did also build temple. He built the Juhu temple, he built the uh, Mayapur, Vrindavan. Vrindavan didn't spend a lot of money. We didn't have much money. <laughs> didn't have much money in those days. It was difficult just to get the money. 
but uh, mainly the money was going for books, to print the books, many books, and at one point even they printed 17 books in two months, big books because Prabhupada had translated the Chaitanya Charitamrita and he translated more volumes of more cantos of the Bhagavatam, but they were printing very slowly. It was like one book every six months. So Prabhupada got really tired of it and then Prabhupada told them, he said, you have to do everything in two months. I'm giving you two months to print everything. And they were saying impossible and Prabhupada said, not, no, there's no impossible. Nothing is impossible. And so then they went on a marathon and they did it. And all the books got printed. So it cost a lot of money. <laughs> the, all the money went on book distribution. And Prabhupada used to tell temple presidents, you know, temple presidents in, in Prabhupada's time, the money was coming from book distribution mainly. We'd go out on Sankirtan and distribute books and there wasn't a, a congregation really, not an active congregation to give money. So the money came from uh, the devotees that they would go out and distribute books. And Prabhupada told devotees that 50%, whatever you collect, 50% should go for book distribution and 50% you can maintain the temple. So like that, Prabhupada really put the emphasis on book distribution. He said, even you have more books in the temple, he said, it's good. Later on, he said, you can always go out and distribute them. He said, you, know, you don't need to keep money in the bank, just keep books. <laughs> keep your money in books. So that was a big instruction. And Prabhupada followed that. Yes? Very nice. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Let's see. Where are we? Um, so King Indra, oh, that no, okay. Some points about dealing with the spiritual master. A disciple should never be a hypocrite or be unfaithful to his spiritual master. A hypocrite, somebody who says one thing and does another. So, we should deal properly, and proper quotes the verse, Acharya Mam Vijaniyam. One should know the Acharya is my very self, we should properly respect him. He's not an ordinary person like that. So, this is very much etiquette how to deal properly, how to show proper respect to the spiritual authority. And the, pro the problem is, familiarity sometimes breeds contempt. Too much close to the spiritual master. So sometimes we would say, we would say, don't get too close to the spiritual master and don't get too far away. It's a interesting instruction to remember. You get too close and you may find faults, you see faults. And that happened even with Prabhupada. Prabhupada would have sometimes some servant there and Prabhupada would have to change him because he would start to do things on his own without consulting Prabhupada. And Prabhupada would see that they, somebody may come, become over familiar. So Prabhupada was cautious about that. At the same time, you shouldn't get too far away. That we should, you should always want to hear the spiritual master. When the spiritual master is giving classes, you, uh, Prabhupada was always saying, where is so-and-so, where is this person, where is that person? He wanted to make sure that they come, that they come and sit and hear the class. So if you don't hear regularly from the spiritual master, then you may commit more offences. So it's important. We have to have the proper mood in approaching the spiritual teacher. So it's not just taking initiation and then go away. <laughs> Some people do that. <laughs> 
they get initiation, then hardly you see them. But you want to be hearing regular. Initiation is the beginning. Okay, going ahead. Indra, uh, the king of thought, uh, repented his own in his own assembly. Okay. So Brihaspati became invisible and Brihaspati was spiritually more powerful than King Indra. More spiritually powerful than Indra. Although Indra was surrounded by demigods, he could not find peace of mind. Oh. Indra understood. He says here, Alas, my spiritual master has become dissatisfied with me. Now I have no means of achieving good fortune. So Indra understood the gravity of his offence and he's very repentant. However, <laughs> Brihaspati has not appeared. Brihaspati is teaching him a good lesson. If if Brihaspati was to take it lightly, then Indra may not, he may do the same thing again. And so sometimes uh, Brihaspati uh, has to do things like this just to make it very clear, to get the message really through to Indra, that you have to be very careful. And now we're going to hear what happens with the other camp, the, the demon, the Daichas, that they hear about the condition of Indra somehow, I don't know how, but somehow they heard about the condition of the, the demigods and they've got instructions from their guru, Sukracharya, and they come to attack the demigods. And the demigods are defeated. Although usually the demigods win, this time they get defeated. And when Brahma and all the demigods were all injured and then they went to see Lord Brahma and Lord Brahma saw their condition. So then Lord Brahma begins to speak to them and tell them the problem. Right? Text 21 and we hear, he says, because of madness resulting from your material opulence, you fail to receive Brihaspati properly. So, this is their offence. And, and Lord Brahma said, therefore it is very astonishing that you have acted impudently towards him. So Lord Brahma is shocked that these demigods, these supposed to be demigods, they're supposed to be in the mode of goodness, but they, they did not behave, they could not behave properly. Prabhupada writes, Lord Brahma wanted to impress upon the demigods that one's guru should not be disrespected under any circumstances. But the demigods being puffed up by their material opulences were disrespectful. Mm. So this is the danger, material opulence. have to be very cautious. So the, the, the spiritual master also has to be careful of material opulence. Some, sometimes the spiritual master may be carried away by the opulence of his disciple and he may like to enjoy the opulence of his disciple. That's also not good. Sometimes, one time Prabhupada was uh, in India and I heard this pastime from Giri Raj Maharaj who was with Prabhupada at the time. Prabhupada had went to one hill station outside Bombay and they were staying in the home of a wealthy family. And uh, they stayed one night, the next morning Prabhupada said, let's go, I want to leave here immediately. <laughs> Prabhupada just stayed one night. He, he didn't like it, he didn't like it. He said one thing he didn't like was they had a, they had a, a table, one of these, 
what do they call it? You know, the table rotates in the middle. The middle part rotates, so you want something, you just pull the table around. So, they were taking food like this, you know. They weren't serving, they were just having, rotating the table when everybody would just take for themselves. So Prabhupada didn't like this and he didn't, he just thought the whole atmosphere, the whole place was just too opulent and thought it's not going to be good for the devotees. He said, let's leave here immediately. And so Prabhupada was very conscious to protect the devotees. Another time, there was a, one man became a life member in Bombay and he had a, a hotel and he had also a restaurant and the devotees could go there and they could have meals there in the restaurant and even sometimes they could stay in the hotel. So Prabhupada was really upset about that, that he, he didn't like the devotees going to the hotel and eating food in the hotel and he didn't like them staying in the hotel. He said, we have our own temple and we have our own prasadam. You stay here and you take food here. So Prabhupada instructed us, I remember, in Mayapur also, when devotees came for Gorpanima festival, he warned us, don't eat in hotels. <laughs> he said, you are Vaishnavas. You cannot just go here, here and there and eat. You must be very conscious, very careful. So, we must behave properly according to the instructions of the spiritual master. So Lord Brahma is speaking to the demigods and he's telling them the problem that you didn't behave properly and now you've been defeated by the demons. You're, you've defeated the demons many times but they, this time they've beaten you because you didn't treat your guru right. And Prabhupada mentions at the end of the purport, as stated in the Shastras, when one disrespects a respectable superior, one loses his longevity and the results of his pious activities, and in this way one is degraded. Can we have some examples of persons who were guilty of this? And who suffered like this, who lost their longevity or lost their pious activities due to offending superior person? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Once uh, Indira, because he didn't uh, honor the prasad given by Durvasmuni, he got, uh, he, he had to become. Uh, Og and he went, uh, he was in, on the earthly planet. Am I correct, Guru Maharaj? Oh, is that the story? I, you know, I have, I've heard before how Indra was cursed to become a hog. I didn't know the reason why. This is the first time I'm hearing the reason. It's like that, is that he was given prasadam by, by who? Durvasmani with that garland. But I don't know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm mixing up both. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, if I'm correct, Maharaj, it's uh, Gajendra story. Gajendra story? Meaning, no. yeah. So, Indra, um, Durasamani gives uh, garland to Indra. Indra, he disrespects and put it on his uh, uh, Airavata. Mm. So, that, you know, it become, you know, not all the flies, you know, started coming and, you know, coming to the garland. That, that annoys uh, that elephant. So he immediately puts down and it tramples and uh, that is the cause of uh, Samudra Mantana. I, I'm not sure, you know, this is a curse where uh, Indra became a hog. Mm. Yeah, I didn't get it. That's not connected with Indra becoming a hog then. Your story doesn't connect to Indra. Does it? Prabhu, is not speaking? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. 
Anyone else? Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Daksha of India Lord Shiva. Yes, can you tell me more? Daksha of India Lord Shiva Maharaj. Yes, Daksha offended Lord Shiva. Even Shishupal offended uh, Lord Krishna. And because Daksha offended Lord Shiva, what happened? Yes, and there's a whole incident. What happened is Daksha's daughter, wife of Lord Shiva, comes and she sees how Daksha's offending Lord Shiva by not offering oblations to Lord Shiva. So she gives up her body. And when she gives up her body, then all the followers of Lord Shiva come to attack. And they have a big fight with all the followers of Daksha. And ultimately Daksha's head is cut off and is replaced with the head of a goat. And so after Daksha gets the head of a goat, after some time he also gives up his body because it's unbearable to have that head of the goat. But he came again as a prajapati. Okay, so Daksha's life was reduced, yes? And another example? In Hare Krishna. Yes? In Vena, he disrespected all the uh, saintly persons. Maharaj Vena. Yeah. Here comes Kru Vena, right? Kru Vena, he would, he would play with the friends, he would kill them. He would do things like that. He would kill his friends, young boys or some whatever he would, people he was with, he could kill people. He didn't care. He was very cruel. So his father was so disgusted that his father ran away, went off to the forest. He thought, to have such a son, he thought, this is the mercy of the Lord. He has given me such a son. I cannot be attached to him. He went off to the forest to just get away from him, to forget about him. So Krovena was cursed by the Brahmanas. And from the dead body of Vena, they turned the body of Vena and they brought up Maharaj Prithu. Okay, so he lost his life. Yes, any others? Uh, uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, Devanand Pandit offended Srivas Thakur. All right. And what was the result of his offending? I don't exactly remember, Maharaj, but... I, and, uh, sorry, Maharaj, it's not coming to my mind right now. But, he, he didn't uh, get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. It, yeah, he, he begged forgiveness. I, after, he got forgiven only after he served a Vaishnava. He yes. served Vakrishwara Pandit. Vakrishwara Pandit was dancing and kirt, having kirtan and Devananda Pandit kept the crowds back and let Vakrishwara Pandit dance. And so because he took care of Vakrishwara Pandit, Lord Chaitanya was kind to him and told him about his offence to Advaita Acharya and so he went to Advaita Acharya and got forgiven. But initially, Lord Chaitanya told Devananda Pandit, you will never understand Srimad Bhagavatam because you offended pure devotees. Because you're an offender of pure devotees, you will not understand. And Devananda Pandit, he was a pundit of Bhagavatam. He thought he was a preacher of Bhagavatam. He was teaching, he had many students. Lord Chaitanya told him, you will never understand Srimad Bhagavatam because you don't know how to treat pure devotees. Okay, so I was thinking also, uh, does anybody else have any other examples? Uh, Maharaj, Jaya Vijaya uh, actually disrespect uh, Sanat Kumara Sanjaya had to, to take birth to three lives in this earth. <laughs> yeah, they had, to leave, they had to leave the spiritual world, right? 
<laughs> they had to come down. Mm -hmm. I was thinking Kamsa. Kamsa for all, because of all of his atrocities. That he was, uh, he lost his longevity. He was killed by Krishna. So it's mentioned about how he, when one disrespects the respectable superiors, they lose their longevity, lose all their pious activities. So very dangerous, very de degrading. Maharaj, uh, even Jagai and Madai uh, oh. suspended uh, Lord Nityananda. Yes, but what did they? What was their? But they didn't. They didn't lose their longevity, right? Yeah, but uh, because by mercy of Lord Nityananda, they were saved. Hmm. Yeah. Lord Nityananda told Lord Chaitanya, in this age you have to be merciful. So Jagai and Madai also surrendered. They, they apologized, they were very repentant, they became very humble. And so they became very great devotees and they're part of the tree of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Krishna? Yes. yes. Good one. Yes, Sishupa. Uh, can we. Can, yeah, okay. Okay, by their devotion to Sukracharya, they have increased their strength so much that now they are even able to easily seize my abode from me. Lord Brahma is telling Indra that these demons because they have so much respect and devotion for their guru, they worship Sukracharya with great devotion, they've become powerful and that's why they could defeat you. They've increased their strength many times and they can even take Lord Brahma's position. And so this is a big transformation. They've really, the demons have become transformed simply because they respected their guru. By the strength of the guru, one can become most powerful within this world. And by displeasure of the guru, one can lose everything. So, we have to be very cautious. And then the purport, Prabhupada quotes that nice verse which we often hear, Jaipataka Maharaj often will tell us like that, use this verse. By the mercy of the spiritual master, a lame man can cross mountains, a blind man can see the stars, a dumb man can recite poetry. Hmm? This is the mercy of the spiritual master. They can make the impossible possible. So, very important to get the mercy of the spiritual master. We have to really be eager to get that mercy. So Prabhupada writes, although the demons are insignificant in comparison to Lord Brahma, because of the strength of their guru, they were so powerful that they could they could even seize Brahmaloka. Yeah, Sukracharya was very powerful. Sukracharya is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, right? Do you know Sukracharya in Bhagavad Gita? Have you seen his name there? Right. Yes, right. Krishna is saying among thinkers. Huh? I am Sukracharya. <laughs> so Sukracharya is very powerful. So, and because of their determination to follow the instructions of Sukracharya, his disciples are now unconcerned about the demigods. In fact, kings or others 
who have determined who have determined faith in the mercy of Brahmins, cows, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, and who always worship these three, are always strong in their position. So now Brahma is encouraging the demigods. He's encouraging them. He said, if you worship the Brahmanas, the cows, and the Supreme Lord Krishna, then you're going to be very strong. <laughs> it sounds a bit like uh, what we heard in Govardhan Leela, right? Worship the cows and the Brahmanas in Govardhan Hill. And Govardhan Hill was Krishna. So a similar thing is being taught here. So worship of the Brahmanas and the cows and Govinda, then all the chaotic conditions can be changed all over the world. But Prabhupada says, at the present moment all over the world, governments have no respect for Brahmanas, cows and Govinda. And consequently there are chaotic conditions all over the world. Well certainly we agree there's chaotic conditions all over the world, even more now than in Prabhupada's time. The chaos is even more now. <laughs> so this is the results because they don't know, they don't worship the cows or the Brahmanas or Govinda. We're teaching, we're trying to teach them the importance of these things. It's not easy, <laughs> difficult trying to impress upon people. All right, and then going ahead. So Brahma tells the demigods, I instruct you to approach Vishwarup, the son of Twasta. Take him as your guru. He's pure, powerful, undergoing austerity and penances. And he, please, by your worship, he will fulfill your desires. However, Brahma warns them, provided that you tolerate his being inclined to side with the demons, right? Why would, why would uh, Vishwarup side with the demons? Someone? He had a relationship, uh, Guru Maharaj? Yes. From his of mother's side. Right. Who's the mother? Her mother was Ro Rochana. Rochana. Rochana is his mother. Right. And who is she? She's the daughter of who? Daughter of Daityas. Right. The daughter of the Daityas. So, mother's side is there. So, son and the mother close together, so the, the, the influence will be there. The ch he's influenced by the side of the mother, doesn't know how to... Be. So, that partiality is there and that's a, going to be the problem for Vishwarup. <laughs> Big problem for him. Indra is not going to be happy about that at all when he sees uh, Vishwarup offering oblations to the demons. Anyway, they're told they have to accept Vishwarup, that even though, just uh, Lord Brahma tells them, just tolerate it. You should, he, said, he said, just provided you can tolerate his being inclined with the demons. Of course, Indra, he couldn't tolerate it, but this was required. So thus advised by Lord Brahma, the demigods went to see Vishwarup and we hear how they spoke to him and they come before Vishwarup in a very humble mood. You know, when people want to get a guru, they're usually pretty humble. Yeah, and they come and they sit before the, and, and so these demigods who are, you know, demigods are big people, you know, they're important people in the universe. They're used to being respected. But they've come to get a guru and they've, they come to see Vishwarup and they're very humble and they have to, they speak to him. 
And what's the difference between the what's why why is uh, why why is uh, Vishwarupa a little reluctant to be the guru for the demigods? Anybody know? Because he's going to do the function of a priest, and uh, he may lose his uh, uh, like uh, whatever results he obtained from tapasya. The, yeah, that's one. That's one reason mm -hmm. that he is actually younger than yeah. Sorry, what did you say? Marriages? Vishwarupa felt, Maharaj, Vishwarupa felt he is younger to the demigods. Your voice is not clear, I'm sorry. Can you speak up? Yes. Yeah. So Vishwarupa felt that he is younger to the demigods. He's what? Okay. Someone else can say this. One. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Vishwarupa's father, Trashta, is also equal to demigods. So they Vishwarupa considered them as seniors or elders to him. Right. Yes. Yes. Vishwarup is like young compared to the demigods. The demigods are on the level of his father. So he thinks, you know, I'm young. You know, <laughs> when Prabhupada left the planet, you know, we had gurus who were in their twenties. Prabhupada had appointed people to be to initiate. He'd appointed, I think, eleven people, and some of them were in their twenties, and they were they had to they became gurus, and we didn't quite know how to do it. You know, at one point they were thinking they would have. They, at one point we had the the Vyasa son for the guru in the temple room, and he would have his guru puja in the temple room every day. And things like this, and people all come and offer flowers to him, and, and he's only in his twenties, just a young man, you know. So it was quite difficult, and some of the some of these, of course, many of these gurus, they they had spiritual difficulty because it's quite a challenge for somebody to do that, to take that kind of position as a young man. You no know, young women coming and worshipping you and like that, it's not really <laughs> recommended. So they had this problem. So here also, Vishwarup is a young man and he thinks, you know, I'm young, you know, I, I, can I be the guru for, for all these demigods? And the other reason he's worried about it is, you know, taking on disciples is a burden. The, they're going to use up, you're going, you're going to take some of their karma. That's uh, the understanding at the time of initiation, we understand that the, the guru takes the karma for the disciple. So Twasta is also feeling a bit like that, that you know, I'm going to get the karma, I have to get the karma for these people. So he's all, he says that usually brahmanas, pure-hearted brahmanas, they won't take disciples. They don't want to be bothered. They don't want to take the disciple. You know, take accepting disciples can be a lot of trouble, headache. You get their problems. They come to you. And, you know, you have to deal with them. Yeah, because you're the guru. You have to help them. You have to be available to guide them. So Vishwarupa is reluctant. But anyway, the demigods are very humble, and they're you know we see how nicely they're speaking to. Vishwarup here that telling him about the duty, what you should do, and the, the acharya teaches Vedic knowledge, gives initiation, is a personification of all the Vedas. <laughs> so they're glorifying him, you know, they're telling him it's very special. And they tell, they, they tell him also their situation, 
that we've been defeated by our enemies and we're very much and aggrieved, please mercifully fulfill our desires. Please fulfill our prayers. <laughs> like this, they're, they're really humble, they're really begging. So Prabhupada explains in the Nectar of Devotion that he said, actually spiritual, a person doesn't really want very much to have disciples, but when people come, if they're properly qualified and if they're really eager and deter anxious to get that spiritual initiation, then it's the duty of the spiritual master to accept them. It's the duty that he should accept a qualified person. Unqualified persons you don't accept, but if somebody is properly qualified and they're sincere and genuine, then it's the duty of the spiritual master to accept them. So here the demigods are telling Vishwarup that because you are aware of the Supreme Brahman, we accept you, you're the spiritual master of all orders of life, we accept you as our guru and, and director, so that by the power of your austerity, you may easily defeat the enemies who have conquered us. So you can see it's a very material relationship with the demigods, that they really want to get their power back, you know, they're asking them to help us defeat these demigods. We could say it's material, but we could also say it's their service, because the demigods are servants of the Supreme Lord. So they have the, they've been appointed in that position as demigods on behalf of the Lord, they have a duty to perform. So we should approach a, a guru to do different gurus to do different purposes. Just like the Pandavas, they learn military arts from Dronacharya. So before the battle of Kurukshetra, you have Arjuna, he salutes Dronacharya, although they're on opposite sides, but Dronacharya is his guru. And he learned the military arts from Dronacharya. And so, gurus teach these different things. You have to know what you want. If you want pure devotion, you come to Krishna consciousness. If you don't want pure devotion, you go elsewhere. You know, not everybody wants pure devotional service. People have many different things they want. So they go to different gurus. And the demigods are encouraging Vishwarupa he said, do, they say, tell him, do not fear criticism for being younger than us. And they explain, the demigods explain the difference, right? That there are different standards by which a person is considered young and old. Just like within ISKCON, we're sometimes asked, you know, who is senior and who is junior? What makes the difference? Who is a senior devotee and who is a junior devotee? There's different criterion by which we judge who is senior and who is junior. And it may be by the age of the physical body, but it may also be by initiation, or it may be by their uh, authority, the particular position which they're holding within the society. Or it may be by their realization. And here, in this particular case, in relation to Vishwarup, it's explained that Vishwarup is senior to the demigods because of his expertise in reciting the Vedic mantras. So in that sense, Vishwarupa is senior to the demigods. So it's not nothing wrong with him being their guru, because he's very well, very well uh, learned, very trained in reciting Vedic mantras and therefore he's qualified. Although the demigods say, although you are junior in relation, you may become our priest without hesitation. Yeah, because you're advanced in chanting Vedic mantras, not just on the basis of the age of the body. The age of the body, that's not important. We're not the body, right? So it doesn't matter how old is the body. 
a little bit from the purport here, the brahmanas, the members of the most elevated varna are teachers. But a person in a lower family, such as a family of Kshatriya, Vaishya or even Sudras, may be accepted as a teacher if he has knowledge. This is a very important point, of course, and this is very much applicable in our Krishna conscious society. And Prabhupada brings up Ramananda Rai and Lord Chaitanya, right? In their conversation, Ramananda Rai, what's Ramananda Rai's position? Is he younger or older than Lord Chaitanya? What's his position by caste? He was a student. He was what? Sudra, he was. Alright. Was he a sannyasi? No, he was not sannyasi. He was what? Not a sannyasi at that time. What was he? Uh, he was the, in a position, he was in a uh, um, good position, a government a servant, he was a, in an opulent condition, he was. Yeah, he was the governor, right? He was the governor no, no. on behalf of Maharaj Prataparudra, the king of Utkal. And Ramananda Rai had been appointed the governor. He was away down there at Rajamandri, just opposite Rajamandri on the banks of the Godavari, on the other side from Rajamandri. There's a place there, and the, there's a temple of the Gaudiya Mat there. And they said Ramananda Rai met Lord Chaitanya there at that place. And so it's in Andhra Pradesh, all the way down, and quite not far away from Tamil Nadu. And so Ramananda Rai was the governor overseeing all that place. And he was a householder, I understand. And so Lord Chaitanya, when, when Lord Chaitanya met him, Lord Chaitanya was putting questions to Ramananda Rai. And Ramananda Rai at one point says, you know, you're the sannyasi and you're the brahmana. Ramananda Rai wasn't a sannyasi, he wasn't a brahmana. He said, I should be questioning you. Ramananda Rai didn't feel it was proper. But Lord Chaitanya replied with the famous verse, which we often quote, right? This, kiba vipra kiba nasi shudra nyai, ye Krishna tapavet, se guru hai. Right? If you know Krishna Tattva, then you're qualified to be Guru. It doesn't matter what caste or what birth you have. What is important is that you have to know the science of Krishna. And of course Ramananda Rai did know, he knew very well the science of Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya made Ramananda Rai one of his intimate associates. And along with Swarup Damodar, they would discuss together and they would relish the topics of Krishna. So this is a very nice point here, which is brought up. That there are examples also about spiritual masters who come from not Brahmana families. Can you think of some people? Raj, it is uh, Shukadev Goswami also is not from Brahmina caste. Sukadev Goswami is the son of Vyasadev. Yeah, but he is not a Brahmina family. Yeah, but he is not a Brahmina family. What do you mean? He didn't take the sacred thread. All right, he didn't take the sacred thread. He left home, but he's the son of Vyasadev. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Shila Haridas Thakur is Nama Acharya. Okay, but he doesn't give initiation. We don't hear about Haridas Thakur having disciples. Well, maybe you could say the prostitute, the prostitute who came, <laughs> right? She became a devotee. Mm. Okay, interesting one, Haridas Thakur. But there's, there's, there's some very prominent acharyas who had many disciples who were not brahmanas. Can we say Vishwamitra Maharaj, Vishwamitra? 
But he became a Brahman, Vishwamitra, by dint of his understanding, he became Brahman. Who? No, Sutta Goswami is son of Ramaharshan. Ramaharshan was a disciple of Vyasadeva. They were Brahmins. No, the example I'm thinking of, Naratam Das Thakur. Naratam Das Thakur was not from a Brahmana family. His father was a wealthy, like a Kshatriya or something, but he wasn't a Brahman. And when Naratam Das had initiated some people who were Brahmins, it was a big thing. And, and some of the Brahmins were very upset and they went to the king and the king came and the, the king came with all the men and all the, like that they were coming to meet this Naratam Das. Who is this Naratam that he can initiate people who are Brahmins and he's not a Brahmin. It had never been, you know, they were really upset and what happened on the way there, there were two disciples of uh, Naratam Das who they, they, did a, they did a little trickery. What happened when the king's men and everybody came, they stopped at this village. And so the two the disciples of Naratam Das, who were, they were both actually Brahmins, and they'd been initiated by Naratam Das. So they disguised themselves as merchants, as vendors. And the king's men came, and the king's men came to these vendors, and one was selling pan, and one was selling uh, cups of hot uh, drink or something, maybe. Anyway, the, the two vendors who were actually devotees in disguise, they were speaking to the king's men. And, they, the, and the king's men said, yes, we're going to Naratam Das. And they said, oh, we're also disciples of Naratam Das. And then they began to speak in Sanskrit. And they were speaking in Sanskrit to the king's men and the king's men were like amazed that oh, these two people are Naratam Das's disciples and they can speak fluent Sanskrit and they're just vendors and they're just little village people and they can speak such good Sanskrit and they know all the slokas and they're speaking all the philosophy. So when they met these two people, they understood that, oh, I don't think we want to go and meet Naratam Das. If, if these two people are his disciples and they're like this, and then Naratam must be so exalted, he must be... And, and they ran away, they just went back. They gave up. They said, no, just leave Naratam. Let him initiate if he wants. So Naratam wasn't a, a Brahmin, and, but he initiated many Brahmins. And what about but our own... Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati and Srila Prabhupada, were they Brahmins? Maharaj Hare Krishna, they are not Janmataha Brahmins, but they are Karmataha Brahmins. Okay. Yeah, the Brahmin, the Jati Brahman is not the qualification. Just to have the Brahmana birth. That is not significant. It can be an advantage, it can be an advantage, but it's not the qualification. Well, Prabhupada was, both, both uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati and our own Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada were born in devotee families. They were born in a family of a Vaishnava. So they had that qualification, and that qualification is most important. The birth in a Vaishnava family. And that's mentioned, of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, that you can take people from previous life, they will take birth in the family of devotees. So that's an important qualification. All right, so... Sukadeva Goswami continued. So the demigods request Vishwarup to become their priest. Vishwarup was advanced in austerities, very pleased, and he replies to them hmm. that and he talks about 
accepting the priesthood means I will lose some of my acquired Brahminical power, the Brahminical tejas. I'm going to lose some of it because he's accepting these demigods. He's accepting on their behalf, going to do this service. But, he says, I should do it. I must, I am your disciple and must take many lessons from you. Therefore, I cannot refuse you. I must agree for my own benefit. So he said, for my own benefit. He said, you are all commanders of the universe. So he said, I'm your disciple. And now Prabhupada also sometimes would say, he said, my Guru Maharaj has sent you all here to help me to spread Krishna consciousness. So <laughs> similar like this, Vishwarupa is saying that, he said, you know, I am your disciple, but you want me to do this work, you want me to do this yagya on your behalf, okay, I, I will do it. So, I just noted a little bit of the purport. Thus, the results of the pious acts previously performed by the priest or spiritual master are diminished. Therefore, priest, priesthood is not accepted by learned brahmanas. You know, the intelligent people, they won't accept disciples. <laughs> Next verse. We have to finish this quickly. Uh, a brahmana who desires to achieve happiness by gaining wealth through professional priesthood must certainly have a very low mind. How shall I accept such priesthood? So Vishwarup, priesthood is very nice. You can see his austerity. He's not thinking what I'll get from it. He's not thinking, oh, I have the honor. I'll be the guru of the demigods. He'll not think, he's not thinking the demigods, they'll give me wealth. No, he explains what is the mood of the brahmana, how the brahmana is very frugal. And he doesn't, the brahmana is not thinking at all about what remuneration he will get. And this is mentioned particularly here at the end of the purport. The conclusion is that although a brahmana may receive much opulence from his disciples, he should not utilize the reward of his priesthood for his personal benefit. He must use them for the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so this is the principle. Prabhupada would often say, uh, not one penny for sense gratification, everything for the service of Krishna. We don't mind to receive donations, but we don't use it for our own sense gratification. So that we try to monitor this within ISKCON that whatever donations devotees receive, it's recorded and every year we have to report how much we've received and how much has gone into charity, that how much went into ISKCON projects and other things. Hmm. So it's important, Prabhupada mentions also again in the purport, such priests never demand anything from their disciples to live in opulence imitating kshatriyas or vaishyas. In other words, a pure brahmana voluntarily accepts a life of poverty and lives in complete dependence on the mercy of the Lord. This is the mood of the brahmana. Just like Sudama Brahman, very simple. Madhavendra Puri, he was a sannyasi, but he would not beg. He would never beg, he'd never ask anybody for anything. If somebody came and gave him food, then only he would eat. And Sudama also had that principle, he wouldn't beg, he just couldn't beg. And so his wife and him were, they were practically starving. And Kolaveka Sridhar, Kolaveka Sridhar, he also, he had his few banana trees. And he, when Lord Chaitanya offered him something, he said, no, I'm happy, I, do, I don't want anything, don't change anything, I'm fine. This is the mood of the pure devotees. 
You can think of some more examples like that. Granti Dev, he was a Kshatriya, of course, but he was so renounced and detached. <laughs> He's not even a Brahmin, but he was so detached. Granti Dev. It said that although he was a Kshatriya in his whole life, he never ever ate meat. He was very... Huh? Even, even Vidura Maharaj? Vidura, yes. What did he do? He was even though he born to the uh, me, but he was very well versed with the scriptures and he is always meditating on the Lord. Okay. Yeah, Vidura of course is Yamaraj. Yamaraj is a Mahajan. So he's well versed in the scriptures and he's a great devotee. Okay, just to quickly finish off here, this, let's see. So, Vishwarup said, you are all my superiors. Although accepting priesthood is something sometimes reproachable, I, I cannot refuse even a small request from you. So I agree to be your priest, I shall fulfill your request. And so he becomes a guru and after making this promise, Vishwarup, surrounded by the demigods, performed the necessary priestly activities with great enthusiasm and attention. And Prabhupada talks in the purport about this enthusiasm and attention when we're doing worship, when we're performing any different ceremonies, you must be completely absorbed. The mind should not be diverted. So Vishwarup did this, he performed this duty as a priest. And Prabhupada, in the purport, he explains the meaning of the word purohit. Quite interesting to see purohit. He said pura means family. Right? Pura means, means family and hita means benefit. That's the word purohit indicates that the priest is the well-wisher of the family. Another meaning of the word pura is first. A priest's first duty is to see that his disciples benefit spiritually and materially by all means. So this is the duty of the guru, right? He wants to satisfy his disciples. They should benefit spiritually and materially. And Vishwarup is therefore trying to do this and we hear how he gives it in the, the 39th verse, 39th verse, sloka, we hear how Vishwarup gives the Narayana Kavacha to the demon to the demigods and the demigods use it to get back all the opulence which the daichas had taken from them. So this Vishwarup he composed this Narayana Kavacha. We'll hear about that Kavacha in the next chapter described. So Prabhupada talks about the, the nature of the demons in the purpur and, and describes how the demons are devotees of other gods. They, they don't worship the Supreme Lord, but they will worship other gods like Shiva, and Ganesh and Durga. They're devotees of these gods. They're not obedient to the Supreme Lord Vishnu. So there's always some conflict between the two camps, the demigods and the demons. Just like between the Vaishnavas and the Shivites. During the time of Ramanujacharya, we read there was a particularly demonic Shivite king and he burned out the eyes of uh, a devotee. The, he thought it was Ramanuja and he thought he was burning out the eyes of Ramanuja. And so that kind of thing was going on since a long time. So even long, long ago, in the days of yore, uh, 
that the demigods and the demons they have these conflicts. So by the grace of Vishwarup and this Narayana Kavacha, the, de the, the demigods could get back their opulence. Described here, Prabhupada mentions, Vishwarup made the demigods a protective covering, saturated with a Vishnu mantra. Sometimes the Vishnu mantra is called Vishnu Dwara, and the Shiva mantra is called Shiva Dwara. We find in the Shastras that sometimes the Shiva Dwara and Vishnu Dwara are employed in the fights between the demons and the demigods. Of course, there's a very nice battle which takes place between uh, the Lord Krishna and Lord Shiva. When Lord Shiva is guarding the palace of Banasura, Lord Shiva, Banasura was a great devotee of Lord Shiva, and he got the benediction that Lord Shiva would come and be a guard there at his palace. And so it happened that Banasura's daughter had somehow got involved with one of Lord Krishna's grandsons. Is it Usha and Aniruddha? Right? And so Lord Krishna came with all the army and there was a big fight. And at one point Lord Shiva re releases the Shiva Dwara weapon which burns everything and Lord Krishna re released the Vishnu Dwara which freezes everything. So when everything was frozen then the, Vish the Shiva Dwara could not do anything. The Shiva Dwara be became powerless in the presence of the Vishnu Dwara. Prabhupada explains that sometimes it place gets very hot but still everything goes on but when it gets cold everything stops everything just freezes so the Vishnu Dwara weapon was more powerful than the Shiva Dwara weapon so in this way the, the demigods could conquer the demons and Lord Krishna could conquer Lord Shiva mm. so these pastimes are all told Vishwarupa, who was most liberal, spoke to King Indra the secret hymn that, protect, that protected Indra and conquered the military power of the demons. Okay, are, are there any questions or comments? Anybody? All right. Yes? Uh, here, Vishwarupa says, uh, accepting priesthood causes the loss of Brahminical power. Uh, is it because of the sinful activities of the disciples, Maharaj? Yes, well, simply because of the burden of having, having disciples, accepting a disciple. And if the, the, the disciples certainly are not very qualified, then it's a greater burden. Right. So, it, yeah, the sins, the sins of the disciples. That's the problem. Uh, we see in ISKCON, we try to be very, very careful that before people come for initiation, that they're properly prepared. They should have undergone some purification. We read about uh, Sanatana Goswami and Rupa Goswami before they joined Lord Chaitanya's movement. They did also some preparation. They hired brahmanas to come to their home and they did rituals and they gave food and charity and the different things which they did in preparation for joining Lord Chaitanya's movement. And similarly within the ISKCON society, people coming to Krishna consciousness and when they want initiation, they have to prepare, they have to practice regularly chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and attending the classes and offering their food and everything. So some standards are there and that makes it easier for the spiritual master. But if, this, if the disciples are not qualified, then it's certainly a problem. I said there's no, there's no problem in accepting qualified people. But if people are not qualified, then it's a problem. 
So that's, and that even if you accept people, even if they are qualified, you have duties to them, responsibilities, and it takes time, and it may interfere even with your own sadhana. That you're so busy taking care of disciples that you don't get time. You don't get a lot of time left to do your own sadhana. You're so busy looking after others. So that can affect the spiritual position of the, the, the guru. And we saw Srila Prabhupada during the final days. He held up his arm and he said to one devotee, his arm was just skin and bone. He said, this is the result of accepting unqualified disciples. So generally when the spiritual master suffers any kind of disease or illness or like that, it's not his karma, but we understand it's due to the reactions of the karma of disciples. Uh huh. Is that all right? Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. In this connection, I just would like to ask: uh, Is that uh, the karmas affect only the diksha gurus, or even the siksha gurus also uh, have to undergo these effects? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, if you're a shik if somebody's a shiksha guru they and they're giving shiksha, they're also going to be involved with the karma. Right. They give it's some. Nice point to note. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Not just a diksha guru, and not only that. We hear, we read also about the the king. Also, the king. Uh, they also take one sixth of the karma for all the citizens, and the husband and the wife. Their karmas are interrelated. So it's not only the guru, the diksha guru taking all the karma, there are many people involved taking karma. Banu Krishna Maharaj? Yes? Maharaj, but guru takes the uh, disciple on the behalf of his guru or he's a representative of Krishna. So he takes the disciple as a representative of Krishna. So uh, even though because he's not having his, he, he's representing. So even though he gets all the karma? The guru takes the disciple as a representative. The guru is the representative of Krishna. Yeah. So and he takes the disciple also on behalf of Krishna. Right. Yes, right. Yes, guru has to be, that's the point. Guru has to be transparent. That's another point. That the guru has to be transparent, that he's offering that, this person to Krishna. He's not taking the person just for his own pleasure, but he's taking it on behalf of Krishna. So, so my question is, when guru is taking on behalf of Krishna, so then, then also guru is responsible or he's just transferring the disciples to Krishna, he's just immediator. So even though he is responsible for the karma of the disciple, Yeah, he's responsible for the karma, but other people are also responsible. I was explaining. You know, you're, you're not, it's not like the guru is taking all the karma. Because the person who's getting initiated, probably he's, they're married, they have a family, there's karma there. And, and it says in the Bhagavatam, the king takes one-sixth of the karma for all the citizens. So he's a citizen of a country, working a job, there's karma there. It's not just only the guru taking the, all the karma. It will depend on the mood of that disciple and how much they're, how much they're giving up everything material to enter into devotional service. It will depend on the commitment of that disciple. When they come forward for initiation, are they, are they, have they fully given up their material life?
to take up spiritual light? Have they finished with the material world? Then they're ready for initiation. That, that's, that's the highest standard for initiation. You know, not many people come at that standard. So it's a very complex subject matter actually to discuss who's taking the karma at initiation and how much karma the guru is taking. And, but the, certainly the point is there that we should be transparent. The good spiritual master should be transparent that he offers everything for the service of Krishna. Now I heard Jaipataka Maharaj also say one time at initiation, he told the person recommending someone for initiation, he said, you have to take 50% of the karma. <laughs> he said, you're recommending them? I said, you take half the karma. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, we are just, it's only about the unqualified uh, disciple we are talking about. And what about the qualified disciple? Yeah, well, qualified disciple, then there's no karma, right? If one is really qualified, fully qualified, then there's, you don't have to worry about karma. He's not going to do anything sinful, and he's already destroyed all his karma by devotional service, so there's no problem. You know, he's done, he's done so much chanting, he's done so much seva to prepare for initiation, and he's not going to do anything more sinful. So, Guru, that's no problem at all. That's what we want. We want all the disciples like that. So, I, I have a question, Maharaj. His pious deeds also get divided to Guru and to King or his initiated or initiated to like uh, Shiksha Guru? What? Does his karma also, if he's a qualified disciple, mm -hmm. Does his activities also get divided to his Siksha Guru and to his Guru, just like the unqualified yeah. disciple? His, well, we said he's, he's on the level of akarma because he's, everything is devotional service. So he's, he's, there's no karma. It's akarma. Hmm? So it, the benefit of his service, yeah. If he's taking instruction from someone, then that's to the credit of that person, not only the guru. But generally, nobody takes the credit, everybody gives the credit to Prabhupada. This is all Prabhupada's credit. That somebody's a nice devotee, they're fully in devotional service, so we see them as the mercy of Prabhupada. No karma. This is what we want. Everybody should be like that when they come. <laughs> they, when they come for initiation, that they're on that level. All right, any other questions? Okay, then we'll meet again on Thursday and we're going on with next class, two chapters. Because one yes, chapter eight and chapter nine. Okay, so chapter eight, chapter nine. So we'll see you on Thursday night. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Gorbaitavrinda Ki Haribo. Jai.